This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today uh, we are speaking with Christopher Parker, who is the executive director of the Vermont Rail Action Network. Uh, and welcome, Christopher. And I understand you're at a, a nearby railroad location. Can you just tell us where you're at for uh, uh, some uh, background? I, I'm outside on account of not having power at home. Um, so I've driven off to find a connection, and sometimes it's a little loud out here. So I'll do my best. Okay, let me just uh, uh, begin. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this uh, uh, at the beginning. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and how you became interested in railroads. So I grew up next to a railroad line, and I've been interested in... Um, railroads um, since I was young. And um, uh, I have been inspired by some people who came before me who were uh, advocates for better train service and um, realized that I had something to offer in terms of standing up and, and saying, this is important to the kind of community we want. And so, um, for uh, almost 15 years now, I've been involved in, in, um, in doing that. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the Vermont Rail Action Network. Uh, how did that get started and uh, what type of people are involved? And uh, just give us an overview of the group. We're a citizens group that has um, uh, members from a diverse background. Uh, we have people from the business community, um, all kinds of leaders in their local communities. We also have environmental uh, activists and, and people whose primary concern is the environment. And of course, we have um, rail buffs and people who are shippers and um, directly depend on the um, you know, the economic benefits that railroads bring to them personally or to their towns. So in terms of numbers, we have um, about 6,000 people on our list. And uh, of course, a much smaller um, core section of, of um, really active people. Well, that's amazing. 6,000 people just interested in, in railroads in Vermont is, is quite an accomplishment. You know, it's an interesting cause that it, it um, brings together all sides of the political perspective. And in the same room, you have the, you know, the suits and the, and the shippers, the business people, and you have the environmental um, tie-dye folks. Um, because, you know, we're all on this train going in the same direction, ultimately, in life. That's amazing. Well, I wound up in Vermont by train, and the first place I hit uh, on that train journey was Essex Junction. And uh, right. I go there many, many, many times a week, and, and uh, it's just the whole fascinating thing. And I remember the, that great poem called The Lay of the Lost Traveler about uh, Ex Essex Junction being such an important rail hub in the 19th century. And, uh, it, it's a fascinating uh, background, but that's, that's enough about, about me. Could you just tell us a little bit about the state of rail transportation in Vermont and its uh, surrounding areas at the present moment? <laughs> So <clears throat> just a brief summary, Vermont has two Amtrak trains. The one you rode that um, gets you to Essex Junction covers the um, Connecticut River Valley up to White River Junction and then following 89 um, and all the way to St. Albans. And then there's another train on the other side of the state to Rutland and that train goes um, only to Rutland at this point, but um, uh, in a year or so, um, it's planned to extend to Burlington via Middlebury. So um, both of these trains go to New York City, and from there you can get to um, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and, and the Northeast. Um, and then on the other side of the picture, um, we have freight trains um, following these passenger train routes and, and going beyond. Um, the freight brings in uh, grain for um, dairy farmers. It brings in um, fuel. So all of the heating oil and the gasoline that's used in Northern Vermont comes by train. 
um, brings in lumber and, and uh, rock salt for the roads. And, um, you know, that's just what comes to mind. It brings in all the commodities that, that underpin um, life, really. Amazing. How many trains uh, a, a day approximately pass through our state? And, and how, how voluminous is this uh, from a freight and, um, a rail and a passenger perspective? Well, we have uh, about 100,000 uh, people a year riding the Amtrak trains in normal times. Of course, with the virus, it's a completely um, different picture because the trains aren't running at the moment. Um, and in terms of freight trains, there's um, probably 60,000 carloads. And again, apologies for, for being outside here. Um, So in the neighborhood of 60,000 carloads um, pass through Vermont or, um, or terminate or originate in Vermont. And one of the things that I know your organization does, it's, it advocates the, uh, the benefits of, of rail transportation. So can you outline for our viewers uh, some of the benefits of rail transportation? So, um, Rail is an infrastructure asset that makes it possible to do other things with a smaller environmental footprint um, and also a smaller um, land use footprint. So, you know, people hire and um, ship and move and build because the railroad is there. So, um, for example, I know um, people who've retired to Vermont and do so because they know they can go back home to their grandchildren. Um, or I know um, people who have come to Vermont as, as consultants or business people, um, and you know, they know they can go to clients um, when they need to further away. So um, the fact that that's there allows um, the value of our, um, well, our life really, but our property in particular to, to um, go up. Um, and on the freight side, um, it's a similar situation. So, you know, our, our feed mills would be out of state and trucking in if there wasn't a railroad. Um, uh, gasoline would be more expensive and that would affect everything. What, what about the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, tourism? Isn't it just wonderful that, that uh, I remember when I, when I first got here, the, the train lumbered almost through three states and the, the views were fantastic. Uh, what about the yeah. tourist aspects of this? Well, 55% of the people in New York City don't have cars. So if we want their business, we need the infrastructure to bring them here. And even for people who do have cars, you know, the train is an attractive way to get there. Um, they'll choose to take the train. And so that makes Vermont more attractive. Right. Could you tell us now what the, the state of uh, uh, rail situation is? I guess these are the Amtrak, we'll, we'll start with that. How is Amtrak operating? Or what, does it have any uh, plans to increase or? or a, a change its uh, service to Vermont? And, and more particularly, how is your group uh, uh, dealing with that? So um, Amtrak operates as a tenant. So the, the freight railroads uh, are the ones that are in charge of um, maintaining and dispatching and, and supervising, controlling the track. Um, Amtrak takes that role in between um, Washington DC, New York, um, Springfield and Boston, but further north, it's uh, um, the freight that pays the bills for the track and Amtrak um, operates uh, at, with them controlling the line. And in general, they do pretty well. So they're, in terms of their physical assets, it's the train itself. Um, and, and of course, the, um, you know, the infrastructure of ticketing and that sort of thing. So our group, you know, the work of advocacy is the work of relationships. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, it's it's our job to show up. It's our job to uh, um, articulate what's important to us as a movement. And um, it's, you know, we talk to people. So we have contacts within Amtrak. And so I could pick up the phone and, and call someone and say, you know, what, what's this about or something like that. Um, it's not a, it's a collegial relationship. It's not, they're not, we have influence, but we don't have control. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't do what we say necessarily. Now, <clears throat> the trains in Vermont are um, paid for by the state of Vermont. And so the state of Vermont has a different kind of relationship. Um, it's a relationship as a customer. Amtrak provides the service to the state. And so they do do what the state says. And of course the state is accountable to all of us. It's the state is, is the expression of the citizens of Vermont, right? So um, that's where the, the line goes. And our job is to educate and um, you know make sure people are aware of what's going on or not going on and to pass along to the leaders and decision makers kind of the aspirations and the vision that that we would have for um, you know a, a cleaner greener future with more trains and um, I guess we also have some expertise collectively and and you know among our board and myself uh, from paying closer attention and, and being involved in the industry. Well, what efforts right now, I know the legislature I, I, I is uh, up for re-election this year, but uh, the Vermont legislature and, and the House of Representatives, what efforts have you been making uh, with uh, uh, the House of Representatives in the Senate and the Vermont legislature uh, about uh, the, the goals of uh, transportation in Vermont? Um, the Navy, uh, who needs uh, more of a push? Well, it's an interesting situation right now because of the virus. And yeah, we're, I guess, um, interested to see how the financial situation of the state is gonna play out. Uh, we're worried because much of transportation is funded by and therefore follows the priorities of the federal government and federal funding that comes with it. Um, that uh, federal priorities and federal funding is very highway oriented. Um, the Amtrak funding in the state of Vermont has in the past not had any federal funds uh, for operations. So it has made it easier in the past to um, think that the Amtrak trains could be a target in tough budget times. There's, that's simplifying a situation because in fact, the state does have a contractual obligation to, um, to continue the service through Essex Junction and White River Junction as part of the rebuild of the tracks that happened about 10 years ago. But, so we're looking to see as everyone is what the big picture is gonna be in terms of the financial state of Vermont. And there, um, are probably going to have to be choices made. And of course, um, you know, we know that the trains are important to us and, and um, to many people, and it's our job to stand up and say so. Um, <clears throat> so it's, at this point, it's sort of a, a wait and see. How has the, the COVID-19 situation uh, affected this? And how, I know that you put out some uh, very interesting information uh, recently about trains in the, in the era of COVID-19. Tell us a little bit about that. All right, so on the Amtrak side of things, the trains are not running in Vermont. And what happened is in April, um, ridership just went down, down, down. No one was traveling, which was a good thing, of course. Um, and um, so the trains were stopped um, and they have continued to be stopped. Of course, once you stop a service, it's easier for it to stay stopped. 
Um, at the moment, uh, you know, most people entering Vermont are under a quarantine requirement. So I, I think that as long as that continues to be um, widespread, um, the trains are probably going to continue, passenger trains are going to continue to not run. Um, that's causing some concern among our group. Um, you know, there's a variety of perspectives as far as how much we should lock our lives down and um, and how much we should open the economy up. And so that that diversity is in our group as well. And there are people who are upset that the trains are not running right now. Um, there are other people who think, well, you know, good, because we don't want anybody coming to Vermont. Those are not the people whose livelihoods depend upon um, tourism, of course. On the freight side, oh, and I should say before moving on here, um, other states have taken uh, a more mixed approach than Vermont has in terms of their Amtrak trains. So for example, Maine um, also has a quarantine, um, but they have restarted some, but not all of the Downeaster service. And they're seeing about 12% um, of the normal ridership at the moment. Um, on the other hand, about half of those riders in previous times were commuters into Boston, and that market is has not returned. Those people are working from home. Mm -hmm. So you could think of it as 25% of the normal Maine to Boston uh, visitor traffic. <clears throat> so that's where we're at. People are not traveling for business. Uh, they are traveling for vacations, but at dramatically reduced levels. And the sense from the um, Downeaster management is that most of the riders right now are visiting friends and family, that, that those connections are, you know, what's most important to people and, and, um, and they do continue that travel. So on the freight side, nationally, we're about 85% of the freight movement from before the virus, um, where that level of traffic is, is where we're at now. Um, it had dropped dramatically. For example, there were no new cars moving for a few months. Um, and now it's coming back on the, in, in the um, shipment of containers, that's pretty much back to before the virus level. So that represents consumer spending is um, pretty much back where it was, um, but manufacturing is down from before the virus and, and freight traffic in terms of commodities reflects that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other interesting thing is just nationally, coal is down a lot. Uh, power use during the virus has gone down and that the first thing to, to um, not be used has been coal. So. There's definitely an environmental benefit from that. And that's, of course, reflected in the freight numbers. Could you just maybe for a, a minute, uh, talk about the employment picture, uh, maybe before or now, or, and certainly you're working towards the future. Uh, what about the employment picture regarding railroads? Uh, how many people in the state uh, has an employer or, or in, in industries directly related to that or, or the carriers themselves? Uh, I know the New England Central and Amtrak and and the trains that I see around here. Tell us about the employment picture. So in terms of the people who work for railroads, it's not actually that large of a number. Uh, so, you know, we're talking for the passenger services, you know, in ballpark numbers, um, 25 people and each freight railroad is probably about between 100 and 150 people. I'm in total, but the real jobs implication for railroads is the number of people that are employed because of the um, businesses that are supported by rail. And that is, I'm going to tell you a figure from memory, I believe around 6,000 people with direct um, employment because of railroads that would be, that would not have a job in Vermont if that um, infrastructure went away. No, that's pretty substantial. 
but now that's of course a pre-COVID figure and it's actually a few years old. And um, I'm also speaking from memory, so hopefully I'm right. Well, you mentioned the key word there, infrastructure. And, and of course, you know, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure involved like down in Middlebury, uh, uh, different types of uh, railway bridges and, and uh, around. Mm -hmm. uh, how does uh, that impact and what is your group uh, concerned about uh, improvements or uh, infrastructure uh, activities? Um, I missed the last part of your question. So infrastructure. Yeah, basically infrastructure. How are, how are you uh, getting involved with infrastructure improvement or activities or construction or, or reconstruction, whatever? I know there's a lot of uh, those types of physical areas we see around the state, right. and around Middlebury and places uh, in that, in that uh, area. So when we started our, our work um, about 12 years ago, uh, the tracks in Vermont really needed a lot of attention. And we've been fortunate in Vermont to have benefited from some federal funding for specifically for infrastructure work. And that has come about because we've highlighted some priorities and so some money has flowed in that direction. Um, so we're in a much better place now than we were then. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, we have to continue to maintain what we've got. That's always the deal with infrastructure. Um, but at the moment, things are in, in decent shape and um, we can help to, we can claim some credit for contributing to the political environment that's, that's led to that. Um, so that is actually an answer that is uh, in regards to funding. In terms of um, you know, the actual physical on the ground stuff that's there, um, we keep tabs on the railroad network. Um, we are able to say, for example, speed limit is a good proxy for general condition, right? Because um, if the condition's good, then it allows you to go at a reasonable speed. The main lines in Vermont are generally good for, for passenger trains 60 miles an hour and for freight trains 40 miles an hour. Um, that's good. Um, <clears throat> there are um, slower lines, but, and basically for, um, for a rural area, we're in good shape. I noticed you, didn't you have a, a recent uh, uh, activity uh, down in Middlebury uh, about this? Or I, I saw something on the website that, <coughs> that you had a, a recent <coughs> tour or inspection like that. Um, maybe I'm, I'm incorrect. Um, but I know you had a recent event where you invited some local leaders and, and uh, uh, a project like that. <clears throat> well, we're going to have to ask ourselves that question about how we're going to do this kind of thing in a, a um, COVID world. <clears throat> um, we've been talking about having a Zoom based event when the train comes, the Amtrak train comes back into service in Vermont. And that's still just a, a discussion at this point, but it seems like it would be a fun idea to be able to see the train go by on Zoom and then you know, talk about what's going on. And then a little bit later, somebody else has their camera up and we see the train go by, you know. Um, I don't know if we've got the patience for every single station in Vermont, but um, we're thinking about that. I suppose one could do some outdoor based events, but at the moment, <clears throat> I mean, there's the question of what people are up for and want to do. And then there's the question of, you know, how um, ethical is it to really bring people together in this time? Well, I've, I've said to my, uh, some of my other guests uh, that uh, frequently involve activities of bringing people together. When uh, this crisis is over, I'm going to invite you back. And when you get those things prepared, uh, we're going to uh, let you talk about it then, you know, uh, whenever the, the crisis is over. Uh, but I, I want to ask you something uh, about, you have a very impressive uh, of mailing list there, or at least email list. Tell us what people can do. Uh, how can they uh, connect with the Vermont Rail Action Network? Uh, uh, 
you have a membership base, uh, uh, volunteer donations. Tell us how the public can support you and, and support the revitalization of rail, uh, passenger and freight in the state of Vermont. Well, thank you. The simplest thing is, is they can go to our website, which is railvermont.org. And um, I should tell you, we're building a new website this summer. So uh, the, the website as it is, is a little stale, but um, they can go there and they can sign up <clears throat> for um, email updates. And um, I, I won't spam them much. I just don't have the time for that. Um, so that is gonna, uh, you know, that's in, in the Department of Education. Um, we could use financial help for sure. And um, like many nonprofits, our fundraising base has dropped a lot um, during this time. So um, we are quieter because of that. So. Um, we could use volunteer help too. Um, people who want to anchor their local town and um, stay in touch with our network uh, and be a little more engaged. Um, not everybody is there because this affects so many people, they're gonna have their own life and, and just passing on the word to their um, legislator um, and, and you know the powers that be that this is important. Um, that makes a huge difference. Um, that always makes a difference, no matter what the issue is. Um, it's so important to to be in communication with our elected leaders, and um, and as not pestering them, they they that's their job. And um, generally, they appreciate hearing from people because um, you know they they want to know where people stand. So um, so do pass along. Uh, what matters to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I've noticed that you have some sponsors and partners, uh, the Vermont Rail Action Network, uh, it's a very excellent uh, website, and you talk about your sponsors and partners. Tell us what that's about. So, um, we work with a variety of organizations in terms of meeting with and, and having conversations um, you know, we have conversations with the state government, we have conversations with environmental groups, uh, with business groups, and, and um, the, the um, planners across the board, the, the community of people who are interested in, in what's happening with rail. Um, sponsors tends to be the people who have a business interest in better rail service. So we're talking freight shippers, uh, people who um, have a business that's directly related to um, rail patronage, like a hotel next to the train tracks, for example, I'm thinking of, or um, you know, another business that that directly benefits and um, rail buffs, of course. And um, we've had some help in the past from the railroads themselves. That's great. Well, let me ask you about uh, one more thing uh, before we conclude, and that's membership. Uh, you have a membership base, and uh, how can people join, and what are the benefits of membership either way? We do have a membership, and um, you can join through our website, railvermont.org. Um, and, you know, really what we're asking for is for people to um, support our work um, and the financial help. Um, you know, it covers all of the, the basics. We're a pretty small little operation, so um, it, it makes a, a big difference. Um, and the benefit is to be a part of the organization and the mission um, in, a, in a way that it is um, contributory. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, and uh, we're gonna, uh follow your progress and uh, hopefully as things uh, uh, improve in the rail and uh, passenger and freight, we'll have you back to explain uh, some of the things that you're doing uh, in the future or when, when those things take place. And uh, I wanna thank you for appearing on Positively Vermont. Uh, this is Dennis McMahon. My guest has been Christopher Parker, the executive director of the Vermont Rail Action Network. Thank you for watching.